scores of Union soldiers, many of them black, stood guard at the poles. It was a scene repeated throughout the South. This really was a remarkable leap in the dark for world history. It's the first large-scale experiment in interracial democracy that had existed anywhere. This may be the most radical single change that emerges out of the entire era, to go from being an enslaved person to not merely a citizen, but to being a voter and a holder of office. In Georgia, Tunis Campbell was among the first blacks to run for political office. Right after the war, he had set up an independent black colony in the Sea Islands of Georgia and declared it off limits to whites. Tunis Campbell was impressive in appearance. He was a six feet tall, habitually dressed in a three-piece suit with a bow tie carried an umbrella, a top hat. The planter class is in awe of him, but, uh, but African Americans are also in awe of him, and, um, and he uses that to great advantage. Trained as a minister, he could reach into the heart of a community. He often stood behind the pulpits in black churches on Sundays and said, under the new acts of Congress, we're going to be allowed to vote. You're going to be protected in that vote. We have a great black majority in this district. We are going to elect black judges. We are going to elect black sheriffs. We are going to elect black senators. The right to vote for black people was an almost spiritual experience. It was a physical manifestation of their freedom. It meant that somebody was actually recognizing them as a political human being. The right to vote was like breathing life into them. Many white Southerners boycotted the elections. They say the government that's created by Thomas Jefferson and George Washington for proud, independent, enlightened men is now going to be occupied by former slaves who cannot read. This must be an injustice, they say. This must be a farce. At this time, only five northern states, all of them in New England with very small black populations, give African Americans the right to vote. Ohio doesn't. New York only gives a tiny number the right to vote. Pennsylvania doesn't. Illinois doesn't. And white Southerners feel that this is just one more example of the hypocrisy of Reconstruction, that white Northerners are willing to inflict upon white Southerners things they would not tolerate in their own home states. When the votes were counted, Tunis Campbell had won a seat in the Georgia State Senate with an overwhelming majority. Black voting carried with it an enormous meaning. It meant that political power was going to be shared between blacks and whites. And this is a very frightening thing for many white Southerners because they have, in effect, lost control over what they have deemed to be their birthright which is the right to run these governments. One white Southerner uttered words of warning. Let not your pride flatter you into the belief that you ever can or ever will govern the white men of the South. Suddenly, you get hundreds of men elected to every office from member of Congress, the Senate, House of Representatives, member of state legislatures, state positions, down to sheriff, justice of the peace, school board official, you name it. For Democrats who had bitterly resisted the Republican Reconstruction Plan, 
The very idea of blacks in political office was an aberration. The Negro is unfit to rule the state, the Atlanta Constitution declared. The Democratic Party will protect him in every civil right. It is unwilling, however, to make him congressman, governor, and judge. It will not consent to degrade its own race by elevating an inferior above it. In the Georgia legislature, blacks were outnumbered four to one. As soon as Tunis Campbell took his seat, he came under attack from whites on both sides of the aisle. What you have here is a very volatile moment in which alliances politically are shifting very rapidly. And from one day to the next, you don't know really what's going to happen. The few white Republicans who did support black legislators were branded as traitors to their race. Blacks should quit dabbling in politics, argued one newspaper, and go to work to earn an honest subsistence. Most whites in the legislature maintained that the new Georgia Constitution only gave blacks the right to vote, not the right to hold office. The Georgia Constitution did not specifically um, allow office holding by black Americans. Of course, it didn't specifically <laughs> authorize office holding by white Americans either. One legislator, Henry McNeil Turner, expressed the outrage of his black colleagues. He was entitled to his seat, he said, and would not cringe or beg for it. Tunis Campbell also refused to be intimidated. On behalf of nearly 500,000 loyal citizens of this state, we do enter our solemn protest against the illegal, unconstitutional, and oppressive action of this body. White legislators made it clear that Campbell was not welcome in the chamber. Many of them uh, put their hands on the butts of the pistols of the guns they wore into the chamber. They shuffled their feet. They banged on the desk. They, they uh, uh, talked about the Congo senator's insolent harangue. Just two months after it had first convened, the Georgia legislature voted to expel its black members. You may drive us out, Turner warned, but you will light a torch never to be put out. Tunis Campbell immediately left for Washington to ask the federal government to intercede in Georgia. The Capitol was in the midst of the first presidential election since the Civil War. The campaign of 1868 came down to a battle over Reconstruction. The Democrats nominated Horatio Seymour and Frank Blair their views were shared by many in populous northern states like New York and New Jersey. The Democratic Party ran arguably the most openly white supremacist election campaign in American history. They painted the Republicans as, quote, nigger lovers. The Democrats absolutely repudiate Reconstruction. They basically say, if we get in, forget about Reconstruction, we're going to repeal all this and put the South back under the control of, of white leaders. Though the views of the Democrats had wide support, many voters gravitated to the Republican candidate, Ulysses S. Grant. They found comfort in the Union general who had won the war. Grant's slogan was, let us have peace. The general understood that the Northern heart cared deeply about reuniting North and South. He promised to support Reconstruction but wrap it up quickly. There was a kind of new politics of reconciliation, a need to bring South and North together because it would be good for the economy, it would be good for the federal government, it would be good for expansion and growth. The 
North was booming. To many voters there, Grant represented a chance to solve the Southern problem. They could then turn their attention to the future. In the South, blacks saw him differently. Almost half a million turned out to vote for Grant because they believed that at last they would have an ally in the White House. The new president seemed to prove them right. Grant and Congress ordered the Georgia governor to readmit the expelled legislators. Tunis Campbell and his 31 black colleagues took back their seats.